Rosa, thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody's uh, support. I'm going to ask you to turn your attention back here. We do this to keep the blood flowing. So we, <laughs> one time we're on the main stage, and then you, know, you turn around, and, and we're in the center stage. So come on over. Uh, this is still the Energy's Critical Mass Summit, because we wanted to cover the entire value chain, which we thought was important. And I think um, one of the challenges we have in the energy transition uh, and it's great to have all three of you uh, on this session. Let me just formally introduce you so everybody knows who's who here. Uh, Marco Arcelli is the ACO, uh, the CEO of uh, AquaPower, based here in Saudi Arabia, in place since Q1 of 2023. So uh, formally welcome to the, um, the kingdom. Uh, formerly worked with Enel, which has been a transition yes. company in itself in Italy as a power group and also operating throughout the European Union. Andrew Laveris, very known here to the uh, Kingdom, former chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical, uh, a strategic advisor for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and he can talk about uh, his role at Dow Chemical, but also some of the other projects they're working on. And Franklin Servan Schreiber is co-founder and CEO of uh, Transmutex, which is a Swiss-based nuclear energy company, uh, and their vision for rapid deployment of nuclear as well. I think we could be much smarter and innovative in the nuclear deployment in the future. Can we give them a nice round of applause before we get started here? Uh, what I'd like to have the three of you share before we get into specific topics for your area, uh, and we talked about the aspirations for COP28, but most people, I would suggest, don't know what goes into a power facility to generate the nature of power, whether it's coal or it's oil uh, or it's gas. Right? Where does nuclear fit into the equation? Can you have a strong enough base load for solar and wind? So we talked about the nature of power, but don't we need to educate society of how critical the power systems of today are and how we make that uh, transition? And Marco, you actually as AquaPower and both as Enel, you're solving problems, right, to clean up the power chain. How do you see this debate today, yeah. whether grid systems as well are invested enough into uh, to support the system of tomorrow. Yeah, so you, you brought uh, two questions into one. One is the nature of power, and I think that one thing that we don't realize, everything comes from the sun, except for nuclear. Uh, meaning that uh, whether it's sun directly or it's sun that was, uh, you know, ages ago and turned into coal or turned into oil or turned into gas uh, or even wind, it's the masses that, you know, the different of uh, pressure in the air are created by the sun at the end. So everything comes from the sun. But the problem of the sun and the wind, of course, is the intermittency. And it's not just a daily intermittency, so you know, day or night or time of, uh, of, of the day, but it's also seasonal. And it's also the fact that sometimes you may not have, uh, you may have clouds or whatever, you may not have the power for three, four, five days in a row at that point. So it's clear that to create resilient grids or resilient and reliable supply of electricity, because the point is whenever we turn the switch on, it needs to go on. We cannot afford to uh, not uh, have it. I am a firm believer in a, a balanced mix of generation. A balanced mix of generation means that every country will use, at the best, all the sustainable resources that they can, all the resources that don't emit CO2, like uh, including nuclear, but then they will need some backup. The backup can be provided for a period, for a transition that will be for the next decades. I think there are combined cycles, high efficient, so you burn uh, uh, natural gas, but a very, very high efficiency, and you run them for a few hours a day. So that's also a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And the other way is uh, through storage. Storage, uh, people think about batteries immediately, but also you can do solar uh, with storage, the concentrated solar power that we pioneered in Morocco, in uh, Dubai, in South Africa. Also the kingdom here wants to install some of that. It's a different technology and can run basically 24 hours a day using molten salt uh, uh, during the night. Uh, or you can use uh, pump storage or different uh, type of technology. So at the end, uh, every system will need to really tailor the solution for the local uh, situation of the country. Okay, good. Uh, Andrew, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, you often talk about, I want to hear the bass when you're listening to music or if you're a jazz fan like I am. Um, but we often, and Marco made reference to it, the base load, you have to have the base load. And I think you know this better than anybody when you were running Dow Chemical, if you didn't have intense power, uh, chemical production was impossible. Uh, so with your manufacturing hat on, Will, can you apply this to the, the nature of power and what is needed in the transition? 
Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, it's been great to listen to the previous panels uh, and the transition story that we have in energy. And as it relates to power, uh, as already mentioned, uh, Marco, the, the way we should think about base power or firming power is, look, it's molecules and electrons, right? And so the electrons developing whatever the solution is on the power side, variable power, solar and wind, let's declare victory. I mean, the technology, the dropping price, all that, uh, obviously regional differences, but let's just move that over to the humanities done a good job. We're, we're sitting here with a couple of big problem sets that have technology and policy solutions available, as already mentioned by Armin NASA, impossible to do it globally. So we need to have regional solutions to what is firming power and base power. And to get to affordable consumption of power so that the consumer, the global south, as referenced in the previous panel, and who has an affordability issue, or even developed countries, the north, as it said, uh, to make that affordable, the technology breakthroughs have to come through to replace what we've used forever, which is coal, oil, gas. Um, we, we need to move down that glide path in a way that's sensible and that is developing answers that work and are scalable. Storage definitely is working there, but I'm in the battery business, I'm in the EV business as well with Lucid. Uh, we're a long way away from efficient battery systems for mobility. For storage, we're getting there, but very costly. So that's not gonna be the answer right now. We have to get there. So a lot of what I'm gonna answer you with on base power is still in our future in terms of technology scaling. Nuclear, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and SMRs, great possibilities there, but still, we've got to scale it. The, two the many hydrogens, never knew hydrogen had this many colors, actually I'm an engineer, doesn't have any color, but okay, let's go with this. Green hydrogen, very unaffordable, a decade. Blue hydrogen, in this kingdom here, very affordable as a transition. Problem, I mean, NASA said it, you can't get the off-takers. Nobody wants to take the risk. So to get to base power on these technologies, and by the way, that needs carbon capture and storage, you need to develop these technologies so they're scalable. My answer to that, base power, firming power, especially for industry, the first part of your question, where you need that, you can't not have the power on when you're making dangerous chemicals, you've got to have it. So what you've got to do fundamentally is transition, and I, my favorite part of the transition is SMRs or nuclear, and blue hydrogen. Uh, we'll get there eventually, maybe the next five years. Good, uh, we, we could uh, also spend some time on whether governments should put the right incentives to trigger it, and we see this uh, in the United States and the European Union. Franklin, a good transition that uh, Andrew provided us because you're Thank you. a nuclear specialist. Uh, you too are a, a proponent of SMRs, right? Because it allows quicker uh, take up, if you will, and, and uh, you don't have that long lead time in terms of construction or the capital intensive cost of a nuclear facility at full scale. But where do you see the innovation in nuclear today? If we had this conversation 10 years ago, it was completely out of fashion. 15 years ago, even more so. Germany still doesn't like it, but you're a proponent. Yes, I am. Um, let's put things in perspective, because Marco started saying, the sun is the source of all energy on Earth, but the sun is nuclear. So everything is nuclear, life, is nuclear in many ways, and we're all having fission in our bodies right now. But the key thing is everything we see around here, all the lights, the steel, the cement, everything comes from a simple 2x in energy density from wood to coal or fossil fuel, just 2x. This is modern civilization. Right now, what we're looking at is solar and wind, which is a great transition energy source but it's much lesser than wood. So we cannot go, in my mind, down the energy density ladder. What we want is to go up. And the only energy source that we know of, source, is nuclear, which is three million times more energy dense than coal or, or, or oil. So we need to get there. Nuclear is fantastic, but with the uranium nuclear, we've had a problem because we've had some major accidents. Actually, they haven't killed a lot of people, but they were very dramatic. And we have a waste problem, and the waste is the toxicity of the waste over the long term. That's the problem. But there is hope, and this is where I come. I think fusion 
has a future. Hope, I hope it has a future. But there is another um, fuel that we could use if we change the whole thing, and it's thorium. And many people have heard of thorium. It just takes a different cycle, and our ambition is to gather the world together in order to make thorium possible. We want to start from scratch. We think we cannot invent the light bulb from improving the candle or the car from improving the horse. Sometimes you just have to step aside and make a break. And we, as a, as a private company, have the ambition to gather governments. We are advancing the technology enough that now we can get the interest of governments that will now bind together and make it happen. That's our ambition. Good. I was saying in our last panel when we were talking about the energy transition that we have 25% of the solutions today for the energy transition, but how do we get the other 75? So I'd love to hear, because we have some very bright minds on this panel, how do we trigger it? Uh, in solar and in wind, it was government incentives for like a decade until the cost for offtake was low enough. But I'd love to have you three brainstorm, how do we accelerate this process? Because nobody's against an energy transition. It just has to be without great shocks to the system, and then there's the cost to the consumer at the end of the day. Marco? Yeah, so let me start with renewables. I think that for solar and wind, you don't need any incentives. They're today the most sustainable, the fastest, uh, the most reliable, the most uh, secure that you can install. And for private investors, it's very quick, kind of the risk, so they go ahead. I think that today the focus is really on uh, uh, the hard to abate sectors, and for these, we need to find a different solution. So electrification is certainly a part, but the other is uh, what do you do with it? So on one side, the storage, can you find affordable storage? It will come over time, and I think it is coming. Uh, but the other one is uh, really, can you use other molecules? And we talk about green hydrogen, but it's the whole suit of molecules, uh, green ammonia, green methanol, and, uh, and so on. So I think there, really, uh, we saw the European Union just passed the red three, so it's going to mandate some demand. So maybe who today is taking a risk on the offtake, like air products on our projects, uh, Neom, uh, that we're developing together with them and with Neom. Uh, air products is the only offtaker. They're marketing the product in Europe and elsewhere. And I think by when the obligation of Red3 will come, if nothing happens, they will be the only game in town. They will make the price. So it's a fabulous idea. So why don't more people come and take off, they can take that risk. You need to take a vision uh, about what's going to happen. The other is to say, can we build a bridge between the most efficient producing place where you can make these commodities, which today is really, we've done a merit order across the world, is Saudi Arabia. We have three times the sun that you have in Europe. We have wind, we have land, we have water. You may say water, we desalinate water at 35, 40 cents per cubic meter. That's nothing. It's less than 2% of the total cost of the final hydrogen that we produce. So we have all the ingredients. The point is, again, how do you bring together this very efficient production with the demand that today is still evolving because our customers that we talk to, they're still thinking, is my final customer going to pay for that? Is it going to pay a small premium, a large premium, or do they need to be breaking even? So this uncertainty can only be covered potentially with some support that needs to come on a global basis because you're going across countries at this point. Good. Uh, Andrew, I think it would be good if you could share the strategy of the kingdom because you're across many different projects. But for example, electric vehicles, you need strategic minerals and metals. Uh, the kingdom's got assets here of over a trillion, 1.3 trillion at least. Uh, they see a super region to Central Asia, to Africa. It's very innovative in its thinking. Are these a sort of kind of large scale projects that are needed to accelerate the transition. And is the kingdom having the building blocks put in place to get there, in your view? Yeah, I think the kingdom does. And the scaling question I answered on your first question, the kingdom is actually willing to put its resources to play. And, you know, think of the courage. I've made my money out of oil and gas, or mostly oil for, you know, 60, 70 years. And now I'm gonna take that resource and develop the alternatives and I'm gonna help the world I'm going to scale them here, and I'm going to scale up the entire ecosystem, not just a piece of it. I'm actually going to build companies like Aqua across the spectrum. So PIF, as you heard from His Excellency the Governor this morning, um, and as you heard actually from most of our speakers on this afternoon, um, and I'm across most of them, as you say, 
is in the supply chain ecosystem building business, capability building, which is not just money, it's clearly money, but it's technology development and people. And to do that and to prototype that is one of the kingdom's Vision 2030 goals. I can prototype it here and I can scale here all the way from critical minerals to EVs as one full value chain. I think the valley of death, if you aren't familiar with that term, TRL, technology readiness level scales, one to 10, if you're not familiar with that, one through three is invention and research, okay? Seven through 10 is commercial scaling. The valley of death is right in the middle, mm. four through seven, where pretty much no one wants to take the risk. Venture capital sits there on the side right now, venture capital is almost gone because of markets being, so you heard the financial gurus this morning. So wh where does that risk get taken? That's where the kingdom has stepped in and said, I, the kingdom, have the financial muscle, resilience and resources to scale in four through seven. I'm gonna bring the world's best minds, the world's best partners, the best advisors, and I'm gonna teach my people how to do that here, and I'm gonna, like Aqua, export it to the global south and elsewhere. I'm gonna put the public purse to work. And in case you think that's a new strategy, if you look at inventiveness in the 20th century, we, did it, we at Dow studied this, the most inventive era in America in the last century was around World War I, around World War II, and NASA, man on the moon. Mm. The public purse funded all of that. And from that came semiconductors and transistors and chips and new materials. So this is not a new phenomena, what the kingdom is doing. Unfortunately, most of the democracies of the world have lost the courage to put the public purse to work. And with the exception of the Biden IRA Act, pretty much everywhere else is all talk, no action. Right. Like the energy minister, his Highness said earlier, we're into the doing business here. So you need a price signal, the public purse, and you need the courage to overcome the valley of death. It's interesting because uh, His Excellency Khalid al Fali said in the investment panel, we're actually uh, lowering the cost of borrowing because we're willing to deploy ourselves, right? Yes. And the credit rating is good. So I have never heard it put in that scale of one to 10 though, because that, that's four to seven is the difficult part. Four to seven, and that's the that's thing. If you go ask any scientist, that's where they die in terms of their ability to take their ideas from invention to innovation. Very interesting. Franklin, last thought. Uh, what can we learn about the German and French model when it comes to nuclear energy? And I think because it's close to the kingdom, the UAE model with the Baraka nuclear facility, everybody was almost laughing that they were willing to deploy a nuclear facility. And why would you need to? Because you have oil and gas. Uh, now they have solar as well. But what is the key lesson we could take away here for your premise about scaling up nuclear? Uh, there is a great lesson in uh, the UAE. 10 years ago, you know, everybody was laughing, why do they need nuclear? It's not gonna happen, it's gonna be too late and everything. It turns out in 2021, the UAE, which has the same sun as Saudi Arabia and the same space, you know, they are producing twice as much carbon-free energy with nuclear as with solar. Uh, so nuclear takes a long time, but then it scales up very, very quickly. You know? And even in Finland, which is 14 years late on their uh, nuclear reactor. Now they're happy because you know, it came just in time for the Ukraine crisis. So um, I think the real lesson is in Germany, they failed after billions of investment to lower the CO2 and to have energy security, both. They failed on both fronts, okay? And France now has the lowest cost energy uh, for electrical energy and also the less CO2. They have 10 times less CO2 per kilowatt hour as Germany, after Germany invested hundreds of billions. So it's very important to consider nuclear. Of course, there is issue with nuclear, but it has to be part of the equation. Yeah, uh, yeah and I don't think the public wanted to shift back to coal in that process as well, because it's the Green Party that was complaining about it in Germany. Uh, that was a very productive 20 minutes so that you all live to the spirit of rapid fire discussion. Marco, Andrew, Franklin, it's great to have you. Nice round of applause to uh, our panel. Thank you very, very much.